Welcome to the session on the Prism of Views. My name is Renee Lewis, and I'm the Country Head of Global Trade and Receivables Finance for HSBC in Bermuda, and the moderator for this session. The trade ecosystem is complex, given there are a multitude of participants in the chain, from buyers, sellers, carriers, ports, custom authorities, insurance, banks, regulators, technology solution providers, and the list can go on. To further enable this ecosystem, digitization in trade is the connector. And while there have been solutions in the past, they have been fragmented and never been able to deliver an end-to-end -end solution. This has resulted in the lack of network effect. The other key challenges have been the lack of digital standards and a common legal framework which has delayed the adoption given the lack of trust in these technology solutions. My panel of experts have over 30 plus years in the trade industry and look forward to sharing their experience with you, the strides that have been made in the industry and their views on this exciting and vital path of connectivity without borders. Firstly, I would like to introduce my colleagues Priyam Bada and Van Kachoman to say a few words about themselves before we get started. Priyamvada. Hello, everyone, and thank you for that, Renee. Um, just as a start to introduce myself, uh, my name is Priyamvada Singh. I'm with HSBC Global Trade and Receivables Finance. I am responsible for uh, product and propositions for North America. Um, as part of um, my role, um, I'm responsible for identifying opportunities for our trade finance business to uh, scale with digitization and technology solutions, as well as external partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, A few words from you. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Renee. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm the Global Head for Documentary Trade as a part of HSBC Global Trade and Receivable Finance. Uh, my, my role largely is two buckets. One is growing the traditional trade book within HSBC and supporting clients to do more trade. But the second part is the in more interesting part is innovation and uh, helping clients to co-create new solutions. So that's uh, broadly what I do. Uh, I do represent HSBC in various industry bodies across ICC, SWIFT, and including the very recently created DSI, which is the Digital Standards Initiative by the ICC. Excited to be here. Thank Thanks, you. Renee. And thank you very much. Let's get started, as I'm sure our viewers are eager to hear what you have to say. Now, Kachuman, why is digitization needed in trade? Interesting question, uh, but I'll, I'll just take you back, uh, you know, before we, we think of digitization, going back, what do our clients really need? And that's where it all evolves from. Digitization in trade is absolutely an essential, and even more now post-COVID, because of three or four key things, what the clients need, they want the trade to be faster, cheaper, safer, and in today's context, absolutely more sustainable, which is what they're looking for. And why would I say that? Uh, faster, right? Today, if you look mm -hmm. at any trade transaction, on an average, it takes about five to 10 days with the paperwork between multiple parties, the banks, the carriers. Would they want it to move faster? Yes, and absolutely that will be a huge working capital save. Cheaper, again, goes along, right? There's a lot of cost that they pay in managing this, be it people, be it the friction that results in inefficient working capital. So that's the second thing that they are looking for. Uh, safer, absolutely, be it the industry, be it in terms of banking, in terms of fraud, double financing, that's the third bit. And last but not the least, which is very critical in today's time, is the sustainability. Uh, absolutely could save the reams of paper that go around in the world, which could be done based on data. But if I could put it in summary, all this, it's just not just the client. If you think about the benefit that it could bring to the industry, it could potentially increase the velocity of trade, significantly reducing times and allowing clients to get trade more and get paid earlier. So that in, in short, I hope I've been able to explain why the industry needs digitization now. Thank you. So both of you, if I'd like to open this up, 
what are the most interesting developments in this space right now? Priyambada, if you wouldn't mind going first. So um, I think Venkat has touched upon a number of the key themes that are evolving in the space right now. And um, I want to start actually also by saying that as much as over the last decade, we've been talking about uh, the integration of the physical supply chain with the financial supply chain, a natural complement to that is actually digitization for all the reasons that Venkat's touched upon. So um, coming off of last year, uh, when you know, there was suddenly actually goods stuck at port because documents uh, weren't, be, weren't able to actually be delivered or other disruptions in the trade and supply chain, that only emphasized uh, the need to accelerate these digital technology adoption. What's also happening right now actually is that um, banks are re recognizing that uh, there are two things to, to digitization. First is just the speed at which it can occur and of course the associated costs. So um, there are initiatives across the industry right now, including from regulatory bodies, um, as such as, of course, um, uh, the uh, industry associations like ICC, DSI, that um, uh, Venkat has touched upon um, in his introduction. The, uh, all these bodies and uh, associations have come together to identify what collaborative um, um, working can actually do to uh, wholesale these initiatives because one of the first steps to, uh, to make this much more commercially viable is reducing the speed at which this technology can be adopted. The speed to automate processes, uh, digitize documents, uh, reduce uh, manual effort, as well as um, automate uh, processes such as um, sanctions checking and uh, AML checks, as well as finally, the final step is just the, um, uh, digital, the ability for all parties to participate in a digital value chain, by which I mean that each party would actually be uniquely identified, just in the simplest term, they'll be uniquely identified. They will be able to pro provide a unique digital signature. So adoption of all of this actually requires the industry to come together, and that's you've touched upon it as well in the introduction that there are challenges to that. The other bit is um, obviously actually uh, how uh, to reduce the cost to adopt this, and that also requires considerable effort. So, um, and I, I think um, I would just uh, uh, close by saying actually the number of efforts across uh, when we say digitization, it's not just one process that we're talking about, right? Where um, trade finance, just by the sheer definition of how we've done it for uh, hundreds of years, is is defined by the sheer volume of paper-based documents. Now, uh, you can talk about um, whether it is uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain. Uh, optical character recognition um, and simple uh, robotic process automation. All of this is part of the journey of digitization. It's a fabulous world that we're living in and the future I see and from what you've just said is insurmountable in terms of what we are going in the world and, and the technology that's there is, is something to reckon with. So looking forward to seeing what the next decade brings. But if I may, with all of this that's going on and with all the collaboration and with all of the different streams and frameworks that are needed, what do you see that are hurdles holding back the digitalization efforts? Um, uh, if I could start just by touching upon uh, the legal uncertainty um, that you mentioned as well. Um, there are, uh, there is certainly a need for uh, standards to be adopted across the industry, including enforceable, simple, simply, the enforceability of electronic documents uh, in all jurisdictions, including the US. Uh, that um, the st development of standards is going to be one critical um, a, a, a part of uh, ensuring that this reaches some scale. And for that, um, governments um, and industry associations need to work together to identify it. And now I think the movement has actually begun because the, the, um, uh, uh, the industry recognizes that there can be no movement without actually uh, government support or regulation or law um, uh, amendments, which adequately recognizes um, electronic versions. So uh, the, um, the adoption of standards 
has to come hand in hand because um, right now we run a real threat and this has also actually been talked about um, in previous years we run a real threat of having digital islands so to speak without interoperability and uh, standards that would allow all of these to work together and that's one of the main um, the hurdles holding back uh, the wide scale adoption of uh, the digitization efforts across the industry the other bit is as i touched upon also costs and um, the, to drive, because there are a number of processes that need to be automated. So cost is a key consideration for banks and companies alike. Absolutely. <clears throat> Rene, if I could even, I mean, the, you know, we spoke about the three decades that we've all seen trade. I think the last two or three years, the amount of changes that have happened or are happening because technology is coming in, and Priyamada absolutely rightly pointed out the likes of beginning with blockchain to OCR to AIs, big data. I mean, it, there's, there's lots of tools now available. I think that's to me the biggest optimic, optimistic view that I do see uh, that has changed. So I'm very positive that this change is likely to happen. But if I go back in terms of the complexity and you called it out perfectly, right? The ecosystem is quite complex. We're talking about putting all these into one setup, the, the port network, the carriers, the banks, the buyers, the sellers. I mean, nothing I think beyond, beyond trade is, is this complex. So I think the positive side is yes, there's technology now available, which is enabling this. And uh, that's, which possibly wasn't available before. So that's one thing. And absolutely to Priyamvada's point, I completely agree. Standards and I think, I think we have to live with the fact that in the short to medium term, there will be multiple networks trying to solve this problem. What technology can enable today is connecting these networks, be it blockchain, be it APIs. Mm -hmm. beyond, beyond just the technology, what is required, there are standards, the data standards, the tech standards. I think that's one area where ICC, DSI, and SWIFT, they all have discussed and they are taking now a very strong step. So again, to me, this is not what was being done in the past, which clearly seems to be a focus for the overall industry. And the last but not the least, yes, the legal standards is critical. Uh, in fact, you would have seen Singapore and Bahrain have rolled out the digital laws. And uh, very recently, the UK uh, sent across the draft of the same law, which is the UN Citral law, uh, for banks, industry to feedback on it. And again, the process of lawmaking has changed so much. It's almost like co-creating a solution, which, which you've never seen before. I mean, when is the last time the UK government sent out a law and said, guys, feedback on this, is this going to be useful? So I think uh, things have changed in terms of tools being available, in terms of the industry taking a stronger interest and the whole collaborative approach with that uh, it, it, this is the time for me. I think things are going to change very soon. Thank you. With all of this going on, is there anything that we could look at possibly doing to accelerate digitization? And I say that with a very broad brush. And the other question I have is, why do you think it's taken so long for digitization to arrive in the arena of global trade? Nevada. So on your second question first, um, as I was mentioning before, um, trade finance actually a um, number of parties that are involved. And um, let's yeah, a large part of the work around digital trade has actually involved the simple, uh, very humble letter of credit. Right? A letter of credit um, it has long been debated about how much embedded cost there is in um, this um, the very traditional trade instrument, such as a letter of credit. Um, you mentioned earlier the number of parties that need to be involved. So um, the work that, um, uh, uh, and certainly a distributed ledger technology is very relevant in this space because of uh, how it's, uh, uh, it will serve as a tool to actually completely transform. It could be a game changer for the letter of credit operations. Now, um, for um, these, um, all of all the parties to come together to agree on um, uh, how um, they will exchange information and how it will be accepted. Um, a few things. 
One, I spoke earlier about actually digital islands, right? So in the absence of um, uh, an, an overarching legal framework that all parties, including cross-border um, the international uh, in international trade, parties that they can agree upon, what's ha what's happening is that um, the, due to the absence of legislation for electronic um, uh, versions, or most critically the electronic version of bill of lading, these closed loop systems have been created where all users agree to a common framework and a common rule book uh, to treat a document like the electronic bill of exchange as um, as an enforceable and uh, valid instrument. So rule books are the way uh, the, the uh, sector, trading sector has actually tried to work around uh, outdated laws. And that creates a problem because of course you rely on um, contractual agreements and any party that is not part of that system uh, hasn't signed up to those agreements that is doesn't need to abide by it. So um, by definition, unfortunately, rule books are not interoperable unless those rule books are uh, consistently um, used and they actually become much uh, more um, uh, widespread in their usage and adoption. So uh, trade finance and certainly the letter of credit is actually ripe for transformation. Um, and we'll, we'll touch upon this later of how um, contour and distributed ledger technology can actually make an, make an impact on that. Um, separately, though, I think um, what's also uh, important, as you mentioned, what can we do together to actually uh, increase the, the accelerate the pace of digitization is um, simply a lot of the work that um, we spoke about, one that uh, we as, uh, as professionals in our um, uh, in our um, the responsibilities and in our roles uh, as uh, leading uh, the industry conversation can come together to certainly I try to identify uh, ways that uh, collaboration and industry associations can make a difference. The ICC has um, uh, certainly uh, put forward uh, standards, the, the DSI uh, that we spoke about, um, the UNESCAP framework agreement on facilitation of trade uh, in Asia and the Pacific has also been put forward. Forward. And there are other government bodies that are um, that are publishing and recognizing, um, as um, uh, Venkat already mentioned, that the the relevance of the um, MLETR, which is uh, the model law on electronic uh, transaction records, for that to be more widely adopted. Yeah, hey, Rene, if I may, if, if I may cover on the on the tech side of what can be done better, and and we've debated that we've seen lots of these new solutions coming up. To me, two things uh, which are critical to success and, and to enable digitization. One is build out your network. And I think that's, that's easier said than done, but what we need is the right set of people. So you start with innovator kind of banks, carriers, companies who start using the solution, see what it is, feed into it, so that the solution becomes ripe and perfect for use. So I think that's something the industry needs to do and people need to be open to adopt that. The second bit, and as we've heard, uh, technology has kind of moved to kind an, an agile approach. What does that mean in a very simple word? You don't need to build the end-to-end -end solution on day one. We're saying build a small MVP, start using it, get the benefits out of it, build the next floor, start, using that and so on and so forth. I think these two things, and it, it's, it's a mix of technology and the adoption and acceptance of doing change in this manner, which is what is required to me uh, if uh, this digitization that's happening in trade has to be accelerated. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left. So I have a couple more questions, if I may. Can you sure. just give us a, just a brief overview of your beginnings of at HSBC and in the blockchain space. And Priyavada, as you mentioned, um, Contour, um, that's one of the applications that the Trade Finance Product Suite uses. And if we could maybe expand on that to give a simple description on how HSBC has been able to leverage Contour um, and its Trade Pro Finance Product Suite, that would be fantastic. Sure. Actually, if I could ask my colleague uh, Venkat to elaborate on that. Sure, I'll do that. So, so Rene, uh, I mean, these were, I mean, if I go back to times when we started this work, it was in a small tech lab within HSBC that Contours based technology was developed. It was end of 2018, and I still remember, which is when we tested a very, very simple flow for a letters of credit. 
Why did we start with the letters of credit? I think to Priyam Vada's point, she did say that it's one of the oldest products that's being used in trade. Uh, does serve a purpose. There's risk mitigation. There's this this enormous amount of working capital that gets generated because of this instrument. But there's there was a challenge because it was paper oriented. It wasn't the most efficient process either for the corporates or for the banks. So we kind of started with that by simply digitizing what was there on a paper that we use into a blockchain uh, where people exchange that or data move between people instead of actual paper. And what really happened instead of a courier taking five to seven days or 10 days, we could see the same transaction happening in a matter of hours. I mean, give or take, I think within a day, even if there were time zone differences like Hong Kong and the US, you would see that uh, the time would be just an intraday because when, when somebody goes off to sleep in Hong Kong, it, it gets done. I mean, that was so exciting for us, especially we were with, with clients who were co-creating that with us. So that was the beginning of the journey, but we've come a long way. We continue to do pilots and POCs. Today we have Contour, uh, which is a blockchain solution, fully commercialized, ready for people to use. Uh, there are about 14 odd banks who are live and about greater than 50 customers already live and using the platform. Uh, and again, if you think about it, it's not just the letters of credit that's the objective. All we are saying, we start off solving something that's needed to be solved, build a network out there, and which is, which is what the challenge was when we spoke about it to begin with. And then you can start building over that. You can get a guarantees, you can build something new on supply chain and so on and so forth. So that uh, was a short description of what, uh, uh, what we did. Uh, yeah, Priyamada, you want to add something? No, I think um, I just want to mention actually that um, we are the largest trade bank in the world. And um, I think uh, just by virtue of holding that position, it sure. was almost incumbent on us to do something about uh, how this uh, trade finance uh, space is actually transforming with um, the adoption of technology. And um, I think uh, in terms of making an impact and uh, uh, to how we started this conversation, meeting our clients' needs, this was um, one of the ways that um, we believe we're, we're actually creating value and moving the industry with uh, uh, adoption of technology. Thank you. With all of that and with all that success that you've had so far, what other opportunities do you think are associated with the digitization of trade? So going back to the theme, and again, this is what our clients tell us uh, in terms of solving or what we could offer them. I think one is the speed, and we've spoken enough about it in terms of working capital efficiency. But if you go beyond that, what it could offer is a real-time visibility. Uh, it's, it's visibility that makes them see their supply chain and plan their working capital well, plan their FX well, and overall uh, manage their suppliers and buyers. So, so that's, that's something uh, that's a natural output of either using a blockchain or a technology which offers end-to-end -end visibility, uh, which is something we do see. The other thing that we expect uh, to happen is you would see once these transactions or the flows are into a network, the way clients use a solution could completely differ from the point of where they plan their inventories, considering these flows, which take a week or, or two, uh, the whole working capital planning could come down or just in time kind of an approach with a shorter leg, which is a huge save for them. And finally, I think from a security perspective, uh, frauds, and this is, this is a larger benefit if I look at the objective as HSBC, we're always there to support the community in terms of SME, MME, and how do we finance them, not just finance them, finance them faster. I think uh, this technology and transparency absolutely could enable us to do that uh, and, and probably address a larger section of the industry. I would agree, actually. Um, I think, uh, for, with, of course, um, all of the, the noise around uh, digitizing the space, the um, uh, the value that customers uh, can can get out of uh, this adoption, and um, I think uh, one of the important things uh, that we need to remember is that uh, the with everything, the the two key words that have emerged out of management of supply chains last year is supply chain resiliency and transparency. 
And that cannot be achieved without um, uh, deploying tools exactly like the ones we've spoken um, uh, about for companies to get the most uh, benefit out of um, understanding where uh, their vulnerabilities are, where their goods are at any point of time, and uh, how to exchange um, information and data um, in a virtual environment. Thank you. I can't believe that we're almost up to 30 minutes and we've just really just started to really just open up the box around the discussion around just the, the, the fantastic strides that have been made in the industry around digitalization and, and what that really, really means is far more reaching than what we've discussed today. And we probably could sit here for the next couple of hours and continue to go on and have further discussion around it. But you know, for our panel and for, for everyone that's looking at this, we do have 30 minutes. And so with that, I would like to say just a few words before we close. And I'd like to bring Bermuda into the ties of this as well. Um, Bermuda and its ties to international business are strong and they're underpinned by key attributes of stability, a robust regulatory framework, a strong infrastructure, transparency and innovation. All things that we've talked about over the course of these last 30 minutes. We are uniquely positioned with local and international companies of all sizes that would be able to benefit from the new world in the way that we do business. To that end, I would like to thank both of you for sharing your views today and hope that everyone found this session to be informative and would love to be able to do something on a wider panel later on as this continues to evolve every day with new and exciting things. In closing, we would also like to thank the Bermuda Development Agency and hope that all that are attending the summit enjoy the rest of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. Thank, thanks a lot, Renee. Thanks, everyone.